record on this computer. Okay, so I'm now recording. Um, let's quickly look at the last lesson. Um, so at the end of last class, I talked about this definition. A sample space is finite if it consists of a finite number of elements. Uh, a sample space is discrete if it can be placed in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers or if it is finite. Sample spaces that are neither discrete nor finite are called non-discrete sample spaces, sample spaces. Okay, so this is an example of a finite sample space. Um, and since it's finite, it is also discrete by that definition. This is an example of a discrete sample space because the positive integers can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with itself. I gave you an example last class of a set that was discrete. It was two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and so forth. That set can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers where the correspondence is either multiplied by two or divide by two, depending on which direction you're going. This set, real numbers X between zero and one inclusive, which is the finite closed interval zero comma one is non-discrete. Um, it's not finite, right? If you think of all the real numbers on that interval, it is not a discrete set. It is not finite and it cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers, okay? So it's, a, it's an infinite set so large that it cannot be put into a list. And so it cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers. Uh, so, right, so on Blackboard, if you go to lessons, and then uh, on the menu tab, there's a button for lessons. If you go to lesson or less note, go to lessons, and then there's uh, the lessons by lesson. So lesson one, lesson two, and so forth. So this is lesson two. So if you click lesson two there, after lessons, you click lesson two, and then this word file is there. Okay, and if you go on YouTube to my YouTube channel, Mike Condazis, and you go to the playlist for Math 241 Fall 2021, uh, both videos are there. Okay, so I post the videos on YouTube on that channel, and I post the lesson notes in the lessons tab on Blackboard. Okay, um, and also if the person who reminds me to um, record the lesson can also remind me to save the whiteboard in the class. For both classes, right? That okay. So um, okay, so that was where we ended last class, and we were just talking about uh, sample spaces. Okay, so we're going to continue from that uh, in this class. Okay, so let's continue. Um, okay, so we we continue with another definition. Okay, so uh, results of experiments. Uh, that are represented by subsets of by subsets of the sample space are called outcomes. Okay. A simple outcome is an outcome represented by a subset consisting of a single sample point. Okay, so this is a definition for an outcome of an experiment and a simple outcome. So results of experiments that are represented by subsets of the sample space are called outcomes. So another example, which I gave last several times is you roll uh, a bare six-sided die, okay, right? Uh, and so the sample space, right, the sample space S is the set one, two, three, four, five, and six. So the so an outcome of this experiment is a subset of capital S, which is the sample space. Okay. So any subset of the sample space is an outcome. Okay. A simple outcome is a is an outcome that consists of exactly one point in the sample space, okay? So uh, for, so the set two, four, six um, is the outcome of rolling an even number. It's an outcome because it's a subset of the sample space. And then also, if you took the set just the set two, this is also an outcome, but it's a simple outcome, okay? Uh, and that's because 
it contains exactly one sample point. Okay, so I'm just reiterating the same idea, ideas, okay? This is an example of an outcome because the subset of the sample space. This is an example of a simple outcome because the subset of the sample space consisting of exactly one point. Okay. Okay, so I think that's clear. Okay, so the next section is 1.3.2, which is on set operations applied to outcomes. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is sets, okay? So let's look at an example of a set. An example of a set is the set A, which contains the elements A1, A1, A2, and so forth, up to and including A sub N, okay? So this is the set of elements A1, A2, up to including A sub N. Okay, so that's an example of a set. Um, I guess why not give a definition of it? Definition, um, a set is a collection, uh, is a collection of elements or objects, okay? And that collection can be empty. If there's nothing in the set, that's also a set, and it's called the empty set, specifically, a set containing no elements is called the empty set and is denoted by uh, this symbol, by that symbol, okay? By that or by just two braces with nothing in it. It's not the box, the formatting is putting the box there. So you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna use the, uh, like that, you know, there's, maybe. A, there's a typo. So those are two ways to represent the empty set. Question? Question? Yeah, Professor. Um, it's right there uh, at the bottom, at the last line. Space of the set containing no, there's supposed to be no, right? No elements. Yeah. Yep. No elements. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so two is subsets. Uh, definition. Uh, a is a subset of B if every element of A is also in B. Okay. Uh, if A is a subset of B as sets, then we write A subset B, like that. That's a notation for it, okay? Okay, so A is a subset of B if every element of A is also in B, okay? Um, so an example of that would be if you let the set A be the set two, and you let the set B be the set two, four, six, then A is a subset of B since every element in set A is also in set B. Okay, so this set set only containing element two is a subset of the set two, four, six, because every element in A, which is only two, is also in this set. See, two is in A and two is in B. So every element in set A is also in set B. So that's an example of a set A being a subset of a set B. Okay, so with, in the context of this course, let A, B be outcomes of the same experiment. That means they are both subsets of the same sample space of the same experiment, okay? Uh, A, the statement A 
is a subset of B is equivalent or means or means that is equivalent to or means that um, the occurrence of A implies the occurrence of B. And we write um, set A is a subset of set B is equivalent is equivalent to uh, outcome A implies outcome B. Okay. Provided A and B are not empty sets. Okay. So a set A subset of set B is equivalent or the same as or means the outcome A implies the outcome B. Okay, uh, the statement, this symbol, that symbol uh, denotes, uh, stands for, uh, is equivalent to um, and is applied to statements or sentences um, that are true or false, but not both. Okay, um, a statement is something, a statement is a sentence that is true or false, but not both. Like the sky is blue, period. That's a statement that's either true or false, but not both. The sky cannot be both blue and not blue at the same time. And so it either is blue or it's not blue, right? So that's an example of a statement. It's a sentence that is true or false, but not both. Okay, so this symbol is saying when you make two statements, it's saying that they're both the same truth value. Okay, uh, two statements being equivalent means they are both true or both false, or that they have the same truth value, okay? So saying one statement if another, when saying one statement is equivalent to another statement is saying that they both have the same truth value, they're both true or they're both false. Okay, so example, uh, so as an example, uh, if we think of two outcomes, so we think of the outcome B, uh, if we think of the outcome B, which is a sum of 11, and we think of the statement E, which is the sum of at least 11, then then what are these two uh, outcomes? So uh, for instance, the outcome A, which is the sum of 11. Uh, wait, sorry. Okay. So you have those two things. The, the um, experiment is rolling a red die and then a green die and reporting the value of both die. Okay. So you roll a red die and a green die. So there's two rolls. And so the event B is the sum of 11 of the two rolls. And the event E is the sum of at least 11. Okay, so the event, the outcome, sorry, the outcome B contains ordered pairs five comma six or six comma five. Okay, so that would be event, that would be the outcome B. And the outcome E would be the sum of at least 11. So either the sum is 11, so you have five and six, or six then five, or 
since it's a sum of at least 11, the sum could also be 12, which means you could have six and then six. Okay, so that's event B and that's event E. So you can see here is that, what just happened? Okay. Uh, okay, so what you can see that, what you can see is that event outcome B is a subset of outcome E. Okay. Uh, okay, so you can, you can easily see that B is a subset of uh, it's just is a subset of E, or that the occurrence of B implies the occurrence of E. Okay. So just like this outcome B is a subset of this outcome E, the occurrence of B implies the occurrence of E. So if the outcome B occurs, then the outcome E occurs. Okay, and so those both happen simultaneously. So that's, that's subsets. Three is on union. Okay, so definition uh, for union. Okay. The union of sets A and B written as A union B is the set of elements belonging to A or to B. Okay. Elements in both sets are included in the union. Okay, so that's the union of two sets. So A, so A union B, the union of sets A and B is the set of elements belonging to A or B. Elements in both sets are included in the union. Okay, uh, the outcome uh, A union B occurs if and only if uh, the outcome A occurs or the outcome B occurs, which includes both occurring. Okay. And a reminder, I think I mentioned this already, right? So note that the word, um, a statement a statement A, if only if statement B e means that statement A and statement B have the same truth value. Okay? And also note that IFF stands for if and only if. Okay, um, yes, that's union, um, and and four is intersection. Uh, so definition: um, the intersection of a set A with a set B, written as A intersection B written as that, um, or as AB looking like a product of two things, is the set of elements belonging to both set, both A and B. Okay, and um, saying set A, um, intersection set B is equivalent to the statement outcome A and outcome B. Okay, so the statement 
A intersection B is equivalent to the statement outcome A and outcome B. All right, so um, all right, let me do this. Okay, so then as an example, if you have an experiment which is uh, rolling two dice, then so you roll two dice and the event D, and the event D is the event of a double, uh, which as an event, as an outcome, that's one comma one, two comma two, three comma three, four comma four, five comma five, six comma six. Okay, that's the event D. And then you have F, which is the event of, of, of a sum of four. And so that's the event, that's the outcome, one comma three, comma two comma two, comma three comma one. Okay, so these are two outcomes. The outcome D is this set and the outcome F is that one. So these are all the doubles where the two are the same, the two rolls, the experiments roll two dice. The sum of four, one, then three, two, then two, or three, then one, right? Those are all the ways you can roll two dice and get the sum of four, okay? So now if you take the operation of intersection, and so you do D intersection F, so you take the intersection of those two outcomes, you just wanna put all the simple outcomes which are in both outcomes. So the only double, right? That's also in the sum that what adds up to four is two comma two. So this is the set containing only only the simple outcome two comma two. And so that's the intersection of those two outcomes. Is that okay, so that's an example of an intersection of two outcomes. The fifth operation is complementation. Okay, so definition. A complementation is a set operation uh, applicable uh, when dealing uh, with a universal set consisting of all elements under consideration. If capital S, if capital S is the universal set, then A prime is the set of all elements in S, but not in A. Okay, so a complementation is a set operation applicable when dealing with the universal set consisting of all elements under consideration. If S is the universal set, then A prime is the set of all elements in S, but not in A. Okay, um, and so what this is, you could say uh, set set A prime is equivalent to the statement a, set A prime is equivalent to the set to the statement not outcome A, okay? The statement A prime, the statement set A prime is equivalent to the, set, to the statement not outcome A. Okay, so before I keep going, I want to go to the whiteboard and illustrate some of this. Um, it, the PDF book is just online, so you just search it online, you put in the title and, and the edition, you get it right, and then you have the text. Okay, so um, okay, so I gave a few examples. Okay, so Okay, so so let's talk about Venn diagrams of some of these things. Uh, so uh, if that's universal, this is this is the universal set. I just drew the, the square, which I denote as S. Okay, so if you have a set A, which you could denote like this, and you could have a set B, which is denoted like this, then inter the intersection is just the space in between in those two sets. There, those are all the elements in both sets. So that's A intersection B. Okay. That's intersection, okay? Um, in union, so that's intersection. 
Um, union, so that's the elements in both sets. Union is just, you have a set A, you have a set B. That's the universal set S. And so if you want A union B, elements in A or in B, then it's that. Okay, so that's the Venn diagram for A union B. Okay, and so that's intersection B and A union B. This is drawing it as Venn diagrams. Um, co uh, for complementation, you have this is the universal set S, and here's the set A. Um, then what's outside of the set A, what's not in set A, that's the set A prime. Okay, so that was complementation. Okay, so we have union, intersection, and complementation. We had sets and, and um, subsets, right? And so that's um, those are examples of three of those operations from the whiteboard. Are there any questions about any of this? Yes, okay. Could you go over the complement one more time, please? Go under complementation? Yeah, please. Sure. Okay, yeah. so the definition is a complementation is a set operation applicable when dealing with the universal set consisting of all elements under consideration. Okay, so you only have a complementation operation if you have a set in that could, if you have what's called a universal set. Okay, set consisting of all elements under consideration. Okay, so if S is the universal set, the A prime is the set of all elements in set S, but not in A. So on the whiteboard, uh, there's your set S, this whole thing. Here's your set A and sits inside the set of all elements. And so if you know, you have to know what all elements are in order to say what are all the elements not in the set. Okay. So, so A prime is all the elements not in set A. Okay. And so you need a universal set for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. It, it makes sense now? Do you have a, a, more questions about complementation? Yeah, no. Okay, okay, so that, that's it. So complementation is just what's outside of a given set, and you just need a universal set to do that. You need to know everything that's outside of a set in order to define a set outside of a set. Okay, six. Uh, so six is on the empty set definition. Okay, uh, the empty set is the set of no elements. We use um, we use that symbol to denote the empty set. Okay. Um, and so the relationship between the empty set and the universal set is the following. If you take the empty set and you take its complement, that's equal to the entire sampling space, okay? So note that, uh, note that the complement of the empty set is the entire universal set, right? What's not in a set with nothing in it is everything, okay? And this is again where capital S is the universal set. Okay, so seven um, is disjoint sets and mutually exclusive uh, outcomes. Okay, so we have a definition. Uh, definition is that A and B are disjoint sets if, if A intersection B is equal to the empty set. Okay, so A and B are disjoint sets if their intersection is empty. So A and B are disjoint sets if their intersection is empty. And so what that means is that, uh, 
Okay, so you have a universal set. And so if you have a set A here and you have a set B here, uh, they're disjoint, right? So you have intersection B is empty. And so this is, this is an example of two sets A and B, which are disjoint. Okay, because their intersection is empty. Okay, that implies that A, B are disjoint. Okay, so A, B are disjoint because their intersection is empty. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, another definition. Uh, if A and B are outcomes and A intersection B is equal to the empty set, then they cannot occur simultaneously and are called mutually exclusive. Okay, so if A and B are outcomes and their intersection is empty, then they can occur at the same time and are called mutually exclusive. Okay. Um, and so the statement, the statement that A intersection B is equal to the empty set is equivalent to the statement that A that outcomes A and B are mutually exclusive. Okay, uh, another definition. Uh, a sequence, A1, A2, a3 and so forth of outcomes is mutually exclusive as a sequence of outcomes if if a sub i intersection a sub j is equal to the empty set for any i not equal to j where um, where both i and j are in the set one, two, three, and so forth. Okay, so that basically what this statement is saying is that this sequence, a sequence of outcomes is mutually exclusive if, if you take any two of them that are different and you take their intersection, it's empty. So if you there, it's pair. It's called pairwise disjoint. Meaning, if you take any two different one, it, if you take any two different A's in the sequence, they're disjoint sets. Their intersections empty. Okay, that's what it means for a sequence to be mutually exclusive. Okay, eight um, other useful facts concerning sets and outcomes. Okay, so A, um, A union B is equal to B union A. Also A intersection B is equal to B intersection A. Okay, and so these are called commutative laws. Okay, so this is the commutative law. Okay. This is the commutative law for union. This is the commutative law for intersection. B, uh, if you have A union B union C, that's equal to A union B union C. And if you have A intersection 
B intersection C, that's equal to A intersection B intersection C. And so those are called the associative law. Okay, so this is the associative law for union and this is the associative law for intersection. Yeah, this just means that you can change the order of the unions. You could union the first two sets and then the third, or you could union the second two sets and then the first, and it doesn't change the result. And so it doesn't matter the order which you union or intersection if you only do union and intersection, right? So this only has unions and intersections in any one equation. Okay, uh, so as a result, uh, we can write, A union B union C. And we can also write uh, A intersection B intersection C without 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 fear of ambiguity. Because of uh, a and B. Okay, so um, so you have the commutative laws and the associative laws, and so um, as a result, we don't need to write parentheses um, when we have three of them like this or like this, right? Because it doesn't it doesn't matter um, the order. Okay, that's B, C. Um, or what's called the distributive laws. So for instance, if you take A union B intersection C, I've now changed the signs, right? There's a union here and intersection there. This is equal to A union B intersected with A uh, union C. Okay, and also, um, a intersected with B union C is equal to A intersected B union A intersected C. Okay, uh, and so those are called the distributive laws, distributive law, okay. Uh, all right, so that's uh, C. So I'm gonna illustrate C on the whiteboard. So uh, the one I guess I'll illustrate is A uh, union the intersection C. is equal to A union B intersect with A union C, okay? Um, and so let's look at each of them. So we have three sets, A, B, and C. Okay, so B intersection C, B intersection C, uh, would be the intersection of sets B and C. So you have this region here, right? So that's B intersection C. And then you would union that with uh, A. And so included in that is A. And so I guess there'll be an overlap of two colors, right? So you have A and you have B intersection C. And so you take the union of them, right? And so you get everything that's highlighted in some color, right? That would be A union B intersection C. And then if you take the Venn diagram on the right side, um, the Venn diagram on the right side, so you have sets A, B, and C, put the sets in the same order. So when you do Venn diagrams, don't change. If you do A, B, C like this, don't do A, C, B, or C, A, B, right? Keep the order the same. Okay, so then um, if you have A union B, oh, it's A union B intersect with A union C. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do um, A union B. 
I'm going to put A union B, and I'm going to put it in uh, green. Okay, right, so you agree with me that's A union B. Now, I, I don't want you to write all the shade regions in your answer, okay? I'm doing this to explain it. No, so A union C would be, let's see, A union C, right? So that would be the, the pink region, right? And so the intersection would be an overlap of those two, the green and the and the and the pink, right? So the the intersection would mean that the regions are both green and pink. So what I want to do is erase something that's not both. This is only green. It's not both green and pink. So I would get rid of that. This is only pink. It's not and green. I would get rid of that. So I'd be left with this. So this is the region A union B intersected with A union C. Okay. And so these two things are equal. Okay, these two represent the same sets. This is the universal set on the outside. Okay, so this would be a Venn diagram proof showing that these two sets are the same. Okay, but I would really just use one color when I'm doing this. I wouldn't use two colors and I wouldn't get rid of it. I would just shade the two sides, right? This would be this and this would be that. But I'm just putting the colors in here so that you can see how this is A, this is B intersection C, and you're taking the union. Here, I erased it before, but there was the pink and then there was the green. There's the pink and green. I got rid of these two because there was only one. And this was what's left that was in both. And so they're the same. Okay, so that would be a Venn diagram proof showing that A union B intersection C equals A union B intersected A union C. And so you can kind of visualize it as saying the A union B is like this. And then you take A union the other one here and the intersection is in between. So it's A union B intersected with A union C. That's kind of how I visualize it. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, the distributive law. Uh, D, um, if you take the complement of S prime, you get the empty sets. Right? Okay. If you take, I already mentioned this, if you take the complement of the empty set, you get the entire sample space. Also, if you take A prime, if you take the complement of A and you take its complement, you get back A. Okay, so A prime prime is equal to A. And so how does that happen? Um, well, if you have a if you have your universal set, and you have your set A, right? A prime would be what's not in A. Okay, right? So that would be A prime. But now if you want the set A prime prime, then A prime prime would be this all. Well, everything that's not in a prime, right? Because the second prime would be selling you what's not in parentheses. So a prime prime are the elements not in a prime. So the elements not in a prime is the set A. So a prime prime equals A. Okay. Any questions? That, that's what I was showing, illustrating there. Okay. Uh, Okay, so that's D, and then E, um, if you take A union S, it equals S. If you take A intersected with the empty set, it's equal to the empty set. And this is for all subsets or outcomes of the sample space S. Well, the out, out, uh, subsets or outcomes A of S. Okay, so A union, the universal set is the universal set. A intersect with the empty set is the empty set. And then F, is if you take A union 
A prime, you get the entire sample space. If you take A intersected with A prime, it's equal to the empty set. Right, so if you look at, um, or if you take A union A prime, you take the blue region, which is A, A or A prime prime. If you take the blue region, which is A union, the pink region, which is A prime, A union A prime is the entire sample space S. You see how A union A prime is S. And if you take A intersected with A prime, it's the empty set, right? Because there is no element that's in both the blue region and the pink region. So A intersection A prime would equal the empty set. Okay, next is G. Uh, if you take A union B prime, that's equal to A prime B prime. Okay. And if you take A B prime, that's equal to A prime union B prime. Remember, A, B is the notation for A intersection B. Okay. Uh, so these are called uh, De Morgan's laws. And those are called De Morgan's laws, these two. Okay, so A union B prime is equal to A prime and B prime and intersect with B prime and intersection B prime is equal to A prime union B prime. So I'm gonna illustrate this also on the whiteboard. So I'm gonna first illustrate the first one, which is A which is A union B prime is equal to A prime B prime, meaning A prime intersection B prime. I want to start using the multiplication notation so that you can get used to it. Okay, so okay, so if you take if you take A and you take B, right? That's set A and B, and you look at A union B prime. Well, well, A union B. Right, the A union B is this, right? That's A union B. So A union B prime is what's not in A union B. So the prime would be what's outside of A union B. Okay, so A union B prime is the complement of the pink region. And so A union B prime, A union B prime is the blue region there. Okay, now A prime intersected with B prime, that's the region So A, A prime, B prime. Well, here's A, here's B. What's not in A, let me use the pink color. So A prime would be what's not in A. So what's not in A, is everything outside of the circle A. Um, B prime would be what's not in the circle B. So that would be this, right? Um, and so A prime intersected with B prime would be what's both uh, a, a purple region and a green region. And so this is only green, so it would not be that. This is only purple. So a prime intersected B prime is, is this. This is A union B prime. And so you can see that they're the same region. And so they're equal. Professor, I have a question. Sure. Um, so does a prime mean like the complement, like a not? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep, that's all it is. The prime is just notation for not. So this is like not A and not B. This is not 
A or B in words. Yep, and so then that's the that's the um, Venn diagram uh, proof of that. And then if you have the other De Morgan's law, which is A intersection B prime, that's also equal to A prime union B prime. Okay, so let's show this. So the, on the left side, you have A intersection B prime. So if you have circle A and you have circle B, then A intersection B prime, well, first you have A intersection B, which is this region. And so A intersection B prime would be everything that's not, A intersection B prime would be everything that's not in A intersection B. So A intersection B prime would be, right? The blue region would be A intersection B prime. Okay, so that's A intersection B prime. And then um, A prime, let's use red. So what would A prime be? A prime is what's not in A. I'm gonna make another Venn diagram for this. That's the universal set S, that's the universal set S. Uh, I'm gonna move the S over here so it doesn't, okay. So, uh, okay, so you have a set A and you have a set B, A, B. And so uh, not A, so it's not in set A. So I'm just gonna, I'm just going to highlight in red everything that's not in the set A. So that's what's not in set A. And it's union um, B prime. And B prime is what's not in B. So this is what's not in B, the green region, right? And so A prime union B prime is just anything that's red or that's red or green. And so you can see that the red or green region is the same as this blue region, right? And so these two are the same. And so in, in regular proofs, I don't want to use multiple colors. You just use like black, you just use regular pen. I'm just using multiple colors to help you see how I'm building these regions, right? So A intersection B prime is this blue region. And then the red region union, the green region, that's A prime union B prime. Okay, and they're equal to the same. And so that's a Venn diagram proof of the second De Morgan's law. Okay. Okay, so, so I just showed us those two equations in G. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to illustrate, another thing I want to illustrate is um, when you have disjoint or not disjoint sets. So I already, already illustrated disjoint sets, right? So if you had A here and B here, where they didn't overlap, then these sets would obviously be disjoint. Right? So these are disjoint. But if you have two sets that do overlap, if they have a non-empty intersection here. So if A intersection B does not equal the empty set, then they are not disjoint. Okay, and so that's how you would illustrate it in a Venn diagram. Okay, so this would be an example of two sets that are not disjoint, and there would be some kind of intersection here. Uh, there would be some kind of intersection here. There would be something in that intersection. I mean, you could draw them overlapping, but if there's no elements in the, this part, they'd still be disjoint, okay? Uh, but there's something here, in which case their intersection is not the empty set, and so they're not disjoint. Okay, so that's illustrating the difference between disjoint sets and non-disjoint sets. Okay. Uh, and so now we're gonna go back to Word, okay? And the next section is 1.3.3. And so that's just to make this statement. We use results, outcomes, uh, and events interchangeably to mean the same thing. Okay, so results, outcomes, and events, all three of them are just synonyms, words that mean the same thing. They're all all three of those are words saying that you have a subset of the sample space, okay? Um, so that means 
that a result or an outcome or an event um, are is is a subset of the sample space. Okay, you can just use three different words. So if I said outcome A, that means the same thing as event A, and that means the same thing as result A. Okay, and so all those three of those words can be used to, to mean the same thing. Okay, so that's the end of of section one. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, I just want to check again the attendance. Um, let me save this. Okay, so we, um, are the following people here? Um, Kashfi Fahim, are you here? Kashfi Fahim? Elvis Solano, are you here? Okay. Okay, so, uh, all right, so that's the end of that section. Um, oops. Okay, so this section 1.3.3, uh, which we just, so we just finished this. Um, so I'm gonna sign a homework, okay? So homework is going to be, so homework one is now assigned, okay? It's due, Um, it's due next Thursday. Okay, so it's due uh, next Thursday at the start of class. Okay, so remember, I'm not uh, collecting homework, and I'm not, I'm not collecting homework. I'm not grading, okay? So you're doing the homework for yourself. Uh, We're going over homework one at the start of class on Thursday, next Thursday. Okay, so that the, the day it's due, so it's due on September 9th. Okay, uh, that's my birthday. Okay, so it's doing my birthday. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, that's that. Um, so if you go on Blackboard, if you go to the homeworks tab and you go to homework one, um, that's homework one, okay? And it looks like this, this is homework one. Okay, so homework one um, is these five problems. Right, and so we've covered all the material now for homework one. Okay, so this is, I want you to do these five problems next Thursday, September 9th. Okay. Professor, all right, uh, Professor, question? I have a question. Yep. Professor, yep. can we go over axiomatic probability for a sec? Or... Okay, so all I did, all I did when going over those four were just give, ideas of what they are. I didn't go into mathematics much of them, right? So axiomatic probability is just the theory of probability built up from a set of axioms, okay? So axiomatic probability theory is this course. <laughs> so the whole course. So most, almost the whole course. So um, you, you, but the definition of it is just, you have a certain set of axioms, assumptions, and then you deduce new statements from those axioms. Okay. And so what we're doing in class every day is axiomatic probability theory, where we start with assumptions, definitions, and then we derive new conclusions. Oh, okay. So it's, it's uh, probably at the end of the semester, we'll be able to distinguish what axiomatic probability, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the semester is focusing on axiomatic probability. Every so often you see a problem, we'll have a problem maybe where I'll mention something that has to do with maybe subjective probability, or there's a problem in which this is classical probability, but you do the same thing as you would in axiomatic, like there's an overlap. So 
Um, like the rolling the dice example is an example of classical probability because there's only six outcomes and they're each equally likely. And so you could think of that as, as an example of classical probability, but it's also an example in axiomatic. Axiomatic probability kind of gobbles up the other ones in that um, the things you find in those are a part of this bigger study axiomatic. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Remind me at the end of class. Okay. So uh, we still have another 10 minutes. Okay. But thank you. Um, okay. So next is one point. That's on so 1.4 next is on rules of operation for uh, probability of events. Okay. So 1.4.1 is on the axioms of probability. Okay, so start with the definition. An axiom is a statement that is assumed to be true. Okay. So this is kind of the things I was just saying. It's, but it's okay. So an axiom is a statement that is assumed to be true. Uh, definition. A theorem um, is a statement um, that can be deduced either from axioms or from previously proved theorems. Okay, so first you have axioms, which are assumed assumptions, statements assumed to be true to build up this theory of probability, this axiomatic theory of probability, right? A theorem though is a statement that can be deduced either from axioms or previously proved theorems. So at the very beginning, you just have assumptions or axioms. Then from those axioms or assumptions, you derive conclusions. Those conclusions are called theorems, okay? Once you've derived, once you've derived conclusions from your axioms, you now have theorems. Those theorems are the proved statements that you derive from your axioms. Now, when you deduce more statements, when you make more theorems, how are you getting these new theorems? You, well, you have the axioms already, but you also have now proved some things. And so future theorem, so later theorems are now derived not just from the axioms, but also from previously proved theorems. Okay, so you have this theory built up where, uh, where you derive new conclusions from all conclusions and from your initial original assumptions called axioms. Okay, make sense? Okay, so that's how you get new theorems. You get new theorems from old theorems and from the initial axioms, initial assumptions. Okay, so now I'm going to talk more about axiomatic probability. In the axiomatic uh, probability, in the axiomatic uh, definition of probability, uh, several uh, simple statements concerning probability are assumed to be true, okay? Uh, they are called uh, the axioms of probability, okay? Uh, then you derive uh, new, then you derive uh, conclusions or when you then you derive conclusions um, or or uh, theorems from these axioms, then you derive more conclusions or theorems from previously proven theorems or and from axioms. Still. Okay. Okay. So the theorems derived from the axioms of probability, either directly or indirectly, meaning maybe now using theorems from those axioms, the theorems derived from the axioms of probability are called the theorems of probability. Okay.
such axioms and theorems are the rules of operation for the mathematics of probability. Okay, so such axioms and theorems are the rules of operation for the mathematics of probability. Uh, so um, once you once you label something as an axiom or as an assumption, you're saying that that's a rule in your study of math uh, in your study of probability. So you can't do anything that contradicts an assumption or axiom that you made. Okay. Also, when you derive conclusions from your axioms or from previously proven theorems. Once you have theorems in your, in your uh, study, you can't do anything that contradicts any theorem that you've that you've gotten. Okay, so so as you keep going, you have more and more rules. Okay, so every time you do something in probability, it has to satisfy all the correctly proven theorems and axioms of your of your of your theory. Okay, so you have to always abide by all the rules as you keep moving forward, and as you keep moving forward, you have more and more rules. Okay, so uh, there's a lot more things that you could contradict. But if you're doing, if you're always doing the right thing, then you shouldn't run into a problem. Um, at least with these rules. If you, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Uh, there's, you can make, you can make axioms which are quote unquote wrong, right? If mathematicians weren't so smart as they were, they could have made these rules could have been wrong. In which you know, if I if you make certain assumptions, you could eventually reach conclusions that that um, contradict each other, right? So these are assumptions that were chosen very carefully, and so that you don't run into these problems. Okay. Um, the pro though there are um, paradoxes, but that's not let's not talk about that. Okay. So the probability um, of an event is a number between zero and one inclusive, okay? So that means the probability event can also be zero and can also be one. Uh, we assign numbers called probabilities uh, to sets called events. Probabilities, um, therefore, are values of a set function, capital P, that assigns uh, numbers little p equals capital P of A to events A of a simple space, capital S. Okay, so the probability of an event is a number between zero and one inclusive. We assign numbers called probabilities to sets called events. Okay, uh, probabilities therefore are values of a set function P that assigns numbers, little p equals P of capital P of A to events A of a sample space. Okay, what does that mean? So I have an idea that we're gonna go more into this next class. The idea of it is that a probability, probability is a set function meaning this is a machine diagram of a function. So if you, let's say your, your set function capital, capital P is this machine, let's say the input of this function is an outcome A of your experiment, meaning this is a subset of the sample space S. Okay, so you're inputting a subset of the sample space S into your machine P or function P, and the output is a number. It's a real number, between zero and one inclusive. Okay, so that's that's a set function where the inputs of that function are sets, and specifically these sets are subsets of the sample space or events or outcomes or results of of your experiment. All right, and the output has to be between zero and one inclusive. Okay, but um, Right, but next class we will go into specifics of the conditions that we want this set function P to satisfy. So there's some conditions on the set function P that we're going to impose and call it a probability um, 
a probability set function or a probability measure. Okay, so next class we will define a probability set function or a probability measure. Okay, so that'll be next class. Um, okay, so we're going to stop here. Uh, but just before we go, don't forget the homework. Homework is due next Thursday. And it is, I'm just going to, it's the same exact thing. I'm just putting it again at the bottom. Okay, so it's due next Thursday to start of class, homework one. Okay, so if you go to Blackboard, you go to homework, it's homework one, it's five problems, and it covers material, you cover the material for that homework. Okay, so it's due next Thursday. Um, again, one more time. Uh, oh, I'm going to save the whiteboard. Let me do that first. So I'm going to save the whiteboard as a PDF file. Good. Stop the share. Good. Okay. Um, so one more time, the following students here is Kashfi Fahim here. Kashfi Fahim. Kashfi Fahim, no. Um, and is Elvis Solano. Is Elvis Solano here? All right, so those students are still not here. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to stop the recording.